um, I, I remember vividly going to work and looking out the window of our apartment. There was a marquee with the time and temperature on it and get up to go to work and it was dark and it would be 30 or 35 below and come home at 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon and it's starting to get dark and it is up to 10 below or 5 below and it would cycle between 30 below and zero, 30 below and zero. Welcome to the Essential Craftsman Podcast. I'm Nate. I've got my dad here at the Essential Craftsman. How are you doing? Good, man. Hi, guys. We're going to talk about working in different types of weather, and you've pretty much seen most that the earth has to offer in terms of... <laughs> at least North America, yeah. Before we do that, I want to give you guys a little teaser and ask how your TIG welding is going. Oh, my TIG welding. Fronius sent me, sent us a beautiful TIG welder, and Mike Smith... Good friend Mike Smith came down from Springfield, a few, oh, an hour north, and he's a great young fabricator, high-end welder, and he came down and gave me kind of a tutorial, a hands-on, first time in my life, first time in my life running a TIG torch, and the learning curve was absolutely perpendicular to a line drawn tangent to the center of the earth, right? I mean, it was a vertical learning curve, and I don't know if I made any progress, but it was it was challenging and exhilarating, and I am going to learn how to do that. Well, was it different than you expected, or what surprised you about it? So, so I'm not a high-end welder, but when, that, when I'm stick welding or MIG welding, you've got some forgiveness in how much movement you can have in your hand at the end of the stick, you know, at point of contact, how much, how much, I'll say, shaking or movement you can have inside that molten pool and still have a decent look. And with the MIG gun, you have the same thing, maybe more. I mean, you have some, when you're weaving, there's some built-in latitude. It, You know, an, an accidental movement can kind of be incorporated into your pattern almost. Mm. But boy, that TIG machine, you had to be absolutely steady, left, right, forward, and back. And the distance from the work had to remain the same. If you dip uh. that tungsten, that tungsten electrode into the work, you're, you're done. You're stopped. So both hands have to be really steady and working together in a particular rhythm that I was hmm. oblivious to. And Mike assures me I'm going to be able to get it, but it's going to take some work. Good luck with that. That's a, There's a reason that people should start with stick and MIG before they <laughs> get to TIG, I guess. Yeah, or right? you'd never take that step. I think I asked you this at the time, but just remind me. What hole is this fill, filling in your work? What okay. what type of welding or fabricating or blacksmithing will this allow you or open a door for you to do that you can't already do? I mean, you, in other words, you made it this far without TIG. What, sure. What's it going to do for you? Sure. So what it enables, what I think, a couple of things. It's going to enable me, for instance, the next time I do a really elaborate floral type gate, you know, making roses or lilies or something, the juncture, the things that you're welding together in something really delicate can be done with TIG in such a way that the weld is as beautiful as anything else, mm -hmm. or the weld can be made almost invisible. You can weld without adding any more filler material than you really need to. Mm -hmm. Can weld super thin. I mean, if, if I want to start making things out of aluminum, decorative things out of aluminum, not that a blacksmith is really compelled to do that, but you can weld aluminum beautifully. You can weld pop cans together. I don't know when I'll need to do that, but mm -hmm. so there's that piece. But just yesterday, I was making a little adaptation on a gate that I that I had installed years ago. They need that gate to lock, mm -hmm. and so I was polishing some pieces and making some fairly, I mean, maybe three times as big as something you would have on a keychain. Mm -hmm. So it was small and it was just mild steel, but it was polished. And I MIG welded it, and I thought, wow, if I could TIG weld right now, I would just stack one of those beautiful little stacks of dimes only the the whole thing would be maybe a three sixteenths or eighth inch fillet weld mm -hmm. running right around these two pieces and never grinded or anything and it would be beautiful mm -hmm. and so it was just yesterday i thought hmm okay i gotta practice that yeah it maybe it's one of those things that you don't even know all the opportunities for it to be put to use until you have it kind of your arms around it that's exactly right when, once you know something it becomes part of your toolkit yeah and i guess doing small and precise work makes a lot of sense think about a, a big knife versus a scalpel or yeah, something, yeah, you know, it's like uh -huh, uh -huh. you kind of can't do certain, you know, I should say as work gets smaller and more precise, the bigger tools get clunkier and, yeah. and less helpful. Maybe it's like that. I think it is like that. And, 
swords. I mean, eventually I'm going to spend more time back in the blacksmith shop and swords are the compelling things. I've got to make them for all the grandkids. And to be able to TIG weld fittings together and a socket onto the back of a set of quillins or something. And I know that that's not traditional, but it would be nice to be able to do that. Great. All right. We had a comment on one of the videos and the commenter, I wish I had your name, but it was something to the effect of asking about your experience in working in all kinds of weather conditions, how you deal with it, staying comfortable and productive. I know that you, uh, you started your career in Oregon with a mild temperature. So maybe let's bypass that and go straight to the first extreme. Well, let's not quite bypass that because mild temperature, but wet, yeah. really wet and muddy. Oh yeah. So I grew up thinking that it was normal to have mud all over you in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. Pretty normal. Rubber boots. Yeah. But when you went in at night, you were usually covered with mud. And yeah. then working in the woods, there was a standard joke. So visualize you get into the crummy and the crummy is the vehicle that picks up the logging crew and they, they live, you know, wherever they live, that they're employed by one company and they got to travel to a remote site anywhere from 10 to 100 miles from where they live, maybe. So it's like a bus? It's like, it's usually like a Suburban. Oh, wow. You know, or a crew cab pickup or something, or a van sometimes. Because it doesn't make sense for everyone to drive their, tri right. their trucks up the dirty, right. muddy road. So there's a crummy driver. He drives the crummy. And that the... the the guy who is in charge now it may be different now i mean probably the the there's probably one or two pickups on the job but it used to be just the crummy on the job and then the log trucks would be coming back and forth to the site all day hmm. so you get on the crummy at you know 3 30 in the morning or four o'clock in the morning so that you can be at the site when the sun cracks over the horizon you can start working but you're you're driving you're riding there in the back trying to sleep in the pouring rain, it's just pounding on that crummy. And you know, when you get there, you're going to get out of that crummy and it's going to be in the pouring rain all day. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you get out the brush, the, the brush crew, the choker setters and rig and slinger are jumping off the edge of the landing down into the brush, working all day. And the brush is soaked and it's pouring rain. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of a, a joke that a company would make more money if they would have a 50 gallon drum full of water on the landing. And as soon as you got out of the crummy, you would jump into the gallon, into the 50 gallons of water. So you're soaked and then get out and go to work because mm -hmm. otherwise for the first half hour, you're kind of yeah. delicately trying to move through the brush without getting wet. And then by about one hour in you're soaked and you just work. Yeah. So, so I kind of grew up understanding that dynamic that darn it, when you're working, sometimes you're not comfortable. Yeah. And, you know, back, let's say that was 40, 50 years ago, but there was less gravel and asphalt on roads then than there is today. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I'm just thinking about mud in general. Some portion of those roads are now paved that were right. not. And That's so you're right. saying you, everybody was muddy back then. And I bet you that was absolutely the case because yeah. there was more dirt roads with less gravel and less asphalt. And So that's especially true in construction. In construction now, like we did on the spec house, sometimes there's additional money spent on the front end to gravel the site. Right. And and when I started as a carpenter in 78, that was not the case. There was not a backhoe on every job. Yeah. There were not as many gravel trucks running around. Rock was relatively more expensive. And so in construction, you were muddier here yeah. too. But in the woods, it's still muddy. I mean, the road is graveled just enough so the trucks can get in and out. And the landing in the winter becomes a sea of mud, like mm -hmm. a half over your knees, halfway up your thighs, yeah. and the logs come in and are dropped into that landing of mud, and the chaser, who's the guy on the landing who runs out and unhooks those logs, just bails out into the middle of that sea of mud, mm -hmm. sinks, fishes down into the mud to find the choker bells underneath to unhook them with his hands, mm -hmm. submerged in the liquefied mud. Yeah. It, it's just a it's a thing. So so yeah. that that is kind of where I grew up. So today, working in rain, I don't know if there's any technology that really makes that better. I mean, maybe there's better raincoats, but not much you can do. <laughs> I, I got, so I'm spoiled now. I mean, coming from Las Vegas where you just kind of didn't work in the rain ever, and then moving up here self-employed, I was able to kind of coordinate that and try to be inside in the winter and outside in the summer with varying yeah. degrees of success. But I, I'm way out of shape for that now. Yeah. I, I tried Filson for work rain gear, and it's great. I mean, it's tough. And it worked okay in the woods. It was it's tinware, mm -hmm. a tin coat, tin pants, filson. It's like a cotton with wax like embedded in it, yeah. and it's like very, it's very. Uh, how do you say that? It's, it's oil skin. Yeah, is it's what it used like to be called. Kind of like, oily, yeah, yeah. 
Um, and it's it's hard. It's hard cotton, and when it's cold, it gets stiff. Yeah. But it's pretty waterproof, and it, you can't wreck it. I tried that in construction. It's just too stiff and limiting. Yeah. Um, the key is to just be moving a lot. The even, key is to be moving. Even if you're wet, whatever, if you keep your, your Boy, body that, temperature that up. That is so true that— the way that is described is that the heat is in the work. Yeah. <laughs> if you're cold at work, just move around. Start yeah. working, you'll get warm. Yeah. And it, you may not get dry, but you'll get warm. Yeah, that's right. So, oh, we were on we were on rain gear. So you can spend a lot of money on rain gear, and I think Gore-Tex is probably the best. But yeah, a tough work site destroys an expensive coat. Right. So mostly you just buy ch- cheap coats and thrash them, and buy another cheap coat and thrash them, and keep a hard hat on. Or in construction, a hard hat works pretty good. I mean, it's dry. Yeah. You know and it's a thing. I remember in Phoenix, you and I'm sure in Vegas, you get so used to n- having no rain yeah. that you, you know, I would leave tools and materials and things in the back of my truck and just because what what's the worst thing that's going to happen? I mean, separate from being stolen. Yeah. And then once in a blue moon, I would wake up and it would have rained on like twelve bags of concrete yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah. That I didn't want to get rain, like maybe yeah. some electronic. That happened several times, and every time I remember being just so annoyed at rain and yeah. almost entitled <laughs> to like not having rain and and it really just kind of goes to show how quickly you get accustomed to the conditions you're in number one and number two there's always something to complain about <laughs> it does and and the same thing happened to me in las vegas i got wrecked for rain i came back here and i never i never got back to the mindset that i had as a kid growing up where it didn't wet, matter if you're wet didn't matter if you're muddy yeah exactly all right so talk about wyoming so after working in the woods here um you were f- carpentry work and sawmilling in wyoming and that that place has a a really what do you say a, a wide climate what's the word to describe a yeah i guess it never gets hot there but well, it gets it's kind of hot for a while it, does, it has a short enough growing season though that you can be pretty confident you're not going to get a lot of heat but it does get cold and it's windy cold and windy. so what was that like so we were in the bighorn basin powell wyoming we moved from here in 1981 moved to powell it's hard to even describe how much i loved the bighorn basin and powell and i've often thought i shouldn't have left it's kind of regarded the bighorn basin is kind of a banana belt sort of they say or at least people that live there claim that oh. i don't know if it is or not but the temperatures are a little more mild than probably per- yeah down around rock springs and and um evanston down in there is so harsh yeah and anyhow the bighorn basin is not not bad but still having said that move there Got there late summer, September maybe, and it is it's sweat it's generally sweatshirt and wool je- and uh, wool shirt and cotton pants weather until the first of November, and then you better have some snow packs and your long johns and another layer and a coat and insulated coveralls. What, what, what do you mean snow packs? Snow pack um, a pack is a a big boot rubber and leather rubber on the bottom leather on the uppers with the big felt liner oh, okay. in there Got so it. you can put a couple pairs of socks on and in the felt liner and you're in your packs mm-hmm. and now your feet are not too bad mm-hmm. um but the and but insulated coveralls everybody was wearing insulated coveralls by thanksgiving every year because mm-hmm. it was down you know zero at night and maybe 40 or 45 during the day but then Generally starting about the middle of December or just after Christmas until about the middle of February, you better buckle up mm-hmm. because you'd get down. Um, I, I remember vividly going to work and looking out the window of our apartment. There was a marquee with the te- time and temperature on it and get up to go to work. And it was dark and it would be 30 or 35 below and come home at 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon. And it's starting to get dark and it is up to 10 below or five below, and it would cycle between wow. 30 below and zero, 30 below and zero for, hmm. oh, you know, three weeks. And that would be the limit of the really harsh weather, and the wind would be blowing. So what's the point of working and trying to frame and build? I guess you're just working inside. Can anything be done outside, or what, what type of work were you doing on work those days? Work can be done outside because, you know, remember from, from the middle of November until the end of February, it was freezing every night. Okay. It would be it would be frosty every single morning. So pouring concrete is hard. You have to you have to cover and keep the ground thawed out because you can't pour on frozen frozen ground, and you can't lay you can't do masonry in freezing. Mm-hmm. 
So there would be big tents, big plastic tents, even then, and canvas tents that could be erected around a structure. Oh. There was an outfit out of Lovell. The Swede was his name, big, hulking old Swedish guy, smoked a big cigar, and he was kind of the local masonry guru in the Bighorn Basin at the time, and he would have three or four or five young guys working, and they would be laying brick right through the bad weather with space heaters blowing everywhere inside these big canvas wow. and visqueen tarps. Wow. And short days. To warm it all the way up to zero. To get it up to where it just <laughs> wouldn't quite freeze. Wow. And there's problems with concrete with that. Carburization and different things. So you can't, you, it doesn't solve every problem. But, huh. but I, I was kind of a hit there because I brought a pair of cork boots with me. Oh. And so you're, framing, you're sheeting a roof and you get there in the morning and your sheeting is covered with frost. Huh. Oh. I put my corks on, jumped up there, and I could pack sheets and get oh, up there. Wow. And they thought that was awesome because the boss, I was working for a guy named Bob Edwards, and he tried it with his golf shoes. So that <laughs> tells you the difference between his mentality and mine, right? Yeah, like track spikes or something. Yeah, like track spikes. And he was a, a school teacher who decided he could make more money as a contractor. Um, yeah, that was Bobby. Met a couple good guys that worked for him. But it was just funny that you always had to deal with cold, windy weather in the winter. So would, would there be like a burn barrel or something yes. like fire on the job site? Oh, man. Yes. Um, I worked for a guy named Christensen. Can't remember his last name. One of the last guys I worked for before I moved to Las Vegas, and we took a job up the South Fork of the Shoshone River. Shoshone, Shoshone, South Fork ran up one side of the Buffalo Bill Reservoir, and it was a nice big house, and the wind would always howl down, down the river up there. And so went to work one morning, and it was... I don't know, 25 below or 30 below. And the wind was blowing probably 50 miles an hour. And I distinctly remember bundled up two pairs of gloves. I mean, all of your insulated coveralls and hats and everything. And you'd put on a pair of worn out cotton gloves and then a pair of new cotton gloves over the top. So you had two pairs of gloves on. And then you're trying to turn nails and nail by hand. Hmm. I remember walking back and forth to the burn barrel, drop all the board ends in there, and sticking the head of my hammer down in that fire, mm. and it would get kind of black. The water would condense on it down there. It would get kind of wet. You'd pull it out. So I would have something warm to hang on to on my way back to work for four or five minutes. Okay? Wow. I could grab the head of that hammer for a little bit and get a little bit of heat out of there so I huh. could turn the nails. And I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say there were times when I was not sure I had hit my finger until I got back to the burn barrel and stuck my hands down and it'd warm up. And uh -huh. then suddenly I remembered, oh yeah, that finger's been hit. Jeez. So it was cold. I've still got a couple fingers that are sensitive to cold, probably a little frostbite. For sure. But so that sounds like a giant whine, doesn't it? That is not a whine. It was, it was terrific. Yeah. And you it were was, happy to have a job. I and... was delighted. Yeah. And I was learning stuff. Mm -hmm. That was the main thing. The, the pay was kind of subsistence level. What Do you remember what they paid you, like an hourly rate? Or do you, do you remember any numbers with that? I think when I got back there, I went to work at $6.50 or something. And when I left, I left a job that was, when I left five years later, the last job I had was paying 10 or 11 bucks. It seems not bad. It seems, not bad. Yeah. And I got to Las Vegas and a month and a, ah, I think maybe I was up to nine bucks back there. Because when I got to Las Vegas, two months after I got to Las Vegas, or a month, I was working a job at 20 bucks an hour. Whoa. 100% pay raise by moving from Wyoming to Las Vegas. Holy and smokes. Not only was it a 100% pay raise, but I was getting 16-hour days. Yeah. It was, it was the end for a while of financial wow. anxiety. And that was... And that was when you were starting there. That was before you really got, yeah, you know, got your, your, yeah. your full toolkit, you know, yeah. and all your. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. 100% pay raise overnight. Yeah. So you got to Vegas in January. And I remember mm -hmm. that because I actually remember that truck ride. And uh, what was that like? Because Vegas, of course, is beautiful right then. And I, I yeah. you knew what, you knew the wet summer was going to be hot. But do you remember just being so thrilled to like. So feel the sun at 70 degrees or whatever yeah. it was. And was there like a real honeymoon period with the weather for Absolutely. you? Absolutely. So I, I think you're conflating the truck ride. I left in January, came back and got you guys and went back down there in March. Oh, maybe it was March. You, you're remembering riding down in I March. remember a sunny day. A sunny least. day riding down yeah. there. So when I went down there in January, my old white truck, the heater wasn't working. Hmm. Driving down 
I, I, when I left three weeks before I had been working at 30 below, you know, middle of December, whatever, left first week of January inside the truck with my insulated coveralls on and packs and two pairs of gloves and my hat because there was no heater. And if I, when I was driving at highway speeds, there was just enough heat wafting up out of the dashboard because of the, the action of the air that it would, it would melt a little hole in the ice in the windshield. And I had an ice scraper on the inside scraping got down through Green River and it started to warm up a little bit, went over the South Pass, you know, where the Mormon pioneers pulled their handcarts up over the trek and died just mm -hmm. pretty close to there, that Willie, Martin and Willie handcart companies. And by the time I got to Green River, it started thawing out. And by the time I got down, you know, towards the Utah border, it was warm. And by the time I got down to St. George, it was nice. Yeah. And it, it was, it was a terrific honeymoon period yeah. pulling in there the first week of January and it was so nice. Yeah. I bet that was pretty it, it uh, was nice. Yeah. Pretty pleasant. Roll the window down. And yeah, I, I, I had no idea what was coming, but by, so worked in middle of December at 30 below and a wind let went down there in January, worked January, February, went back in March, sold the place, loaded the family up and got back down there in April. And by the end of April, it was working 105 above. Hmm. And, you know, by May, anyhow, you know yeah. the transition. Do you remember, com you're not a complainer in general, but do you remember complaining about the cold weather and the hot weather? Or did you have a mindset trick in both of those extremes where you were just kind of like, I'm getting the job done? Do you, do you have any strong memories about like ha having issues with either no. of those extreme weather I, I didn't have I didn't have any issues. And I think that I, I have to thank my dad for that. Because, you know, getting back to growing up around here, wading in the mud and being wet and and stuff, it it just, I guess I just considered it just a cost of working. Yeah. You know, it was just part of, that's what it was. I visualized it just as part of working. Yeah. It wasn't separate from the work. It was part of the work. Yeah. And so, but I do now, I'm a whiner now. I can't, I, I, I softened up, man. I, it's amazing how, maybe this is just a human thing, but people and we can just kind of quickly acclimate mm -hmm. not that we're our bodies are used to it but you see other people dealing yeah. with rough weather and all of a sudden it's kind of like i guess this is just yeah. how it's done and next thing you know yeah you're kind of just dealing with the weather whereas you know sitting here it's a really nice day today it's probably 65 outside yeah, and perfect and when i imagine you know guys in phoenix let's say 110 today whatever it is mm -hmm. lay them block mm -hmm. at one in the afternoon yeah <laughs> And I just kind of think like, I don't, I don't think I literally could do that, Man, you know, but, but hard. the truth is when you kind of are on these job sites and around other people, you, it comes with the territory and there's yeah. something that kind of can click in gear and you just get the work done. And physically you, I, I think you can get conditioned to mm -hmm. it like any other kind of conditioning. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you look at, you look at runners, you look at the people that do those things mm -hmm. and they're conditioned. Their body has responded to it, made physiological changes. I know that when I first got to Las Vegas um, in the winter, I was working in T-shirts and shirt sleeves when everyone else was bundled up. Yeah. And then in the summer, they weren't struggling as badly as I was. Yeah. And it took about two years for me to get used to the heat. Yeah. And now anybody who knows me will tell you that I am vulnerable to cold. I've yeah. shifted back to where I still do okay with the heat. But yeah. I'm vulnerable to cold. There are some tips, just like the the layers of clothes and gloves in in Wyoming are heating your hammer head up. But in the heat, I mean, guys on hot job sites, roofing or block or whatever, they got huge hats. Yes. and it I think that truly is like a uh, must have tool, mm -hmm. big hat to keep the sun off of your head and shoulders. Mm -hmm. When I finally kind of got a big sun hat after being there for several years, I was kind of blown away. Mm -hmm. at how it changed everything. It felt yeah. like I was working in the shade all day. Yeah. And I was. You were. You were working under an umbrella. Yeah. I, I I didn't figure that out. When I was when I was framing and working in Las Vegas, so on on the in the commercial construction side, which is where I started out down there, it just wasn't cool to wear straw hats at that time mm -hmm. or it wasn't part of the culture, right? Yeah. Bill hats, which are pretty much useless. Yeah, they are. You know, they what do they do? And we didn't we hadn't copied the Latino, the Mexican culture of wearing long sleeve shirts, which is brilliant. Yeah. It keeps the sun off your body. You don't just get the the radiant heat gain of the sunlight on your skin. Yeah. We were doing none of that and 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 so it just 
I don't know, you stopped thinking about it. Yeah. You just, you just blocked it out and kept working. But there are ways, just like yeah. you're saying, to, to make it better. Yeah, certainly. And drinking a, a lot of water goes without saying, but it's it shouldn't. You, you got to stay on top of it and kind of almost be drinking water as you know, preemptively, mm-hmm. <laughs> even when yeah. you're not thirsty. If you're sweating, you need to be replacing that fluid with water constantly. And then in terms of the other trick, those uh, long sleeve shirts, I same thing. I didn't just kind of didn't make sense to me. And I yeah. saw these landscapers doing that thing. I guys, come on, get what the, you, you want to feel that wind and, and then you'd try it once. And then especially yeah. if you get the shirt wet or just dump some water on you and it all that cotton holds moisture a little longer yeah. and that evaporation probably drops the temperature like 15 degrees on your skin mm-hmm. or more feels cool and you're now your arms in the shade so that there's something to that for sure a lot. And, I, and i really after kind of experiencing that i was like wow that wish i had known that a year i mean ago. the Ar- arab cultures do the same thing right you know voluminous loose robes and white and yeah there's a reason for that but the problem was that the 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 construction culture, particularly the piecework framing culture, is a very cowboy, macho young man. Take your shirt off, stick yeah. your chest out, mm-hmm. kind of a a culture. And so they would, you, yeah. you just wouldn't hear of it, you know. And there's something about even just running or hustling around job site and hats and wet shirts and things that one more thing to keep track of. By yeah. the time you maintain all that debris yeah, you yeah. could almost like get out of there an hour sooner so That's which right. one which one is better well so this is provoking some memories i didn't see anyone wearing straw hats except two guys i don't remember their names they were my age they were doing layout so they're walking around on slabs snapping lines and detailing plates and they could do it so they're moving slow yeah and but i i was stacking mostly up mm-hmm. off the ground crawling through trusses and a crawling through a truss yeah. you can't keep a hat on your head yeah it's just gone and so you forget about it and mm-hmm. you identify that's an annoyance and then you don't think of putting it on when you're down on the ground banging walls together and could mm-hmm. so yeah it's you know landscapers and you're running a weed eater you're doing things where you're a little bit less uh constrained yeah. it, it probably makes the most sense so the the most extreme case of this was john i don't remember john's last name i was stacking roofs for Nevada framers, Southern Nevada framers. I think that was her name. And I was stacking a lot of roofs. I had a little crew and, 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 and there was a guy named crazy John and he lived most of the time on the track or often did slept in his Volkswagen. I'm remembering now he was so smart and all he ever wore was gym shorts. I mean, that's all he ever wore. No shoes, no shirt, no hat. Oh, sounds really smart. Yeah. Really smart. (laughs) <laughs> yeah well there were some other things that he was good at questions. numbers he he and boy could he plate he was a plater there you go he was on on a piecework basis and he had a skill saw and he had a set of bags and he had gym shorts and he lived pretty much on the site till payday and then he lived somewhere else and mm-hmm. i didn't want to hear those stories and then he came back but he was baked like a raisin man mm-hmm. and skin cancer being what it is the way I understand it now, I've often wondered if John, who was probably 10 years older than I was, is still staying out in the sun. Yeah. Well, if he was a raisin, then he's a piece of beef jerky now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. If he's still kicking. As a kid here, logging in the summer, it gets hot here. It gets 103, 104, 105 mm-hmm. for a while. And logging is strenuous and it's up and down and you're fully dressed. You're covered in clothing that you're not wearing to keep cool. You're wearing to keep from getting torn up. Mm-hmm. And you have heavy leather boots on that come way up your leg, and and uh, so you're hot. Mm-hmm. And so I I was very used to drinking two gallons of water a day when I was logging. That's just what it took. I'd take two gallons of water and drink it. And I was used to being soaked with sweat and being, you know, the electrolytes electrolytes get out of balance. You get some muscle cramping, and you take salt tablets or whatever we thought we should do. But I would be wet from sweat most of the day. But in Las Vegas, you would drink. I would drink two gallons of water a day or so. Mm-hmm. And never be wet, but rather my shirt would just gradually turn white. Mm -hmm. And the top of my Levi's and my bags, the belt, my leather belt would turn white. The top of my boots would turn white. Mm -hmm. And you would never really see any water there Mm -hmm. just because the desert was so thirsty. But water consumption was a big thing. Um, Working in the desert in the Southwest is is pretty brutal, but it's probably not as bad as in the tropics or Florida where the humidity is crazy high. Because at that point, I mean wear a hat or not like you you're not getting away from the humidity and the sweat i my, my heart goes out to those guys cause, amen ouch 
you know, that, that it, it's kind of a joke. It's hot, but it's a dry heat. Yeah. Well, and that is a joke, and it's a little bit, I mean, it's, it's, you're just laughing at trying to rationalize high temperatures. But dry heat at least allows evaporation and that temperature. Yeah, so there's something to that. And in, in the desert, if you go in some shade, let's say wherever it is, under even just a canopy, and you sit down for a second, get your heart rate down, you're fine. Yeah. Like it's, yeah, yeah, you're better. fine. You can sit there in 115 degree heat. And if you're not like doing something, it's, it's not a, it's, you're right. fine. That's right. But you cannot do that in Florida when it's even 95 and the humidity is 95. Like that's right. You don't want to be in it at all. I, I played with the jazz band when I was a kid and we did a tour. We started in San Francisco and we played to Orlando, Florida and back. Well, Disney world, at Orlando, Florida and back. We played 69 different gigs in 75 days. It was great. We played in St. Louis for the Jazz Society there, I think. And the power went out at the place we were staying. And I remember it was 95 degrees and 95% humidity. Yeah. 90, 90, 95, 95. And it was like nothing I had experienced. It was just what you're talking about. You yeah. couldn't breathe. Yeah. All you could do was drip sweat. Mm -hmm. That's it. You just dripped sweat and couldn't breathe. And I, I'm glad I wasn't trying to piecework stacks and roofs. Yeah. Well, it's amazing how much work is able to get done across all of these extreme weather, uh, climates and locations. And, you know, even in terms of cold, Wyoming's pretty cold, but there's places that are colder Way worse. Way worse. and they, they build and guys get out in it. And it's That's just right. sort of like another day at the office. And That's right. it's pretty impressive. All right. So I've got a couple more stories of weather conditions in Wyoming, wind is a thing. It's a real thing. Mm -hmm. In Las Vegas, the wind is a thing just because it's like standing in front of a blow dryer set on high temp. You know, it's a hot wind blowing and it's blowing sand. But I remember sheeting a roof with three quarter inch plywood and walking down the roof and grabbing a sheet by the end, holding it from the, on the four foot width and holding it up and the wind would hang the eight feet up in front of me. Wow, and I cool. walked up the pitch with the wind holding that three quarter inch plywood up in front of me by the end and I could get it down wow. if I was lucky. Real wind, you Jeez. know. It struck me as being so such an analog to the fire barrel in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. you know, where you would spend at least 20% of your work day walking back and forth to the fire barrel. In Las Vegas on a hot day, you would spend at least 20% of your work day walking back and forth to the water jug, mm -hmm. just walking, dragging over there and bending over and sucking all the water out of that that you could yeah. and try and you hope nobody realized that you were drinking a little slower than you might so you get a few more moments, mm -hmm. right? And then walking back and I worked for MS Concrete and Dennis Bunker, who was their big push, a very hard, productive, smart, capricious, arbitrary man would scream at the top of his lungs, don't you drink any more water than you can sweat out. We don't have time for you to stop to take a leak. Wow. And he was only halfway kidding. That Jeez. was just that was just the yeah. the family culture. Gosh, right. Gosh, man, that's crazy. Yeah. But that's construction. And that's the other side of the romance of construction. People think, oh, I want a job where I can work with my hands and look back yeah. at the end of the day and see what I accomplished. I want that satisfaction. Yeah. Well the other side of that satisfaction is that sort of a prison, militaristic in your face aggressive expectation by too many people. Yeah. And just because that was then, it still exists now. Construction is a hardball, fairly brutal world. Yeah. And you and gotta brace yourself for especially that. Especially when you're in a a job, let's say, or a a job like a job site that's commercial where there's yep. not some homeowner where, where you have to be kind yep. of delicate and you're a little bit like yeah. holding somebody's hand where it's it's truly just a bunch of businessmen and foremen yep. and huge dollars, and you are just kind of an ant, and yep. they don't care if you get squashed or That's right. leave. It's just, you're, you, man. You're just, talk, you're just part of the machine, man. Yeah. And you better work faster. I'm, when I was in Phoenix, I only did one job, that storage thing, which we made videos of, where I felt like I was getting a look at some of the commercial guys. And this was in the summer, and I was leaving the house like most commercial contractors like at 4 a.m mm -hmm. and you go to a gas station in phoenix at 4 a.m on a in the summertime and it's like hustle bustle <laughs> there's there's so many trucks and everybody's like in line at the ice machine and you can just see people gearing up almost yep. like you know going to war and yep. people will come up to the counter with like 14 bottles of gatorade and yep. all their lunch and everybody's got the sun's still down and it's dark but people are buying big blocks of ice and there's it's, it's right. pretty neat and you and 
all of the, and all of these people, like we talked about long sleeve shirts and I, we didn't mention this, but I wonder if neon orange separate from being, uh, uh you know, a safety or a safety color also reflects heat a little better. I, and it's probably not as good as white, but I kind of wonder cause I don't everybody, know. every, I, I guess it's just the safety aspect. Yeah. Maybe it's a OSHA thing. It, it is thing. safety aspect, but anything that's reflective has got to yeah. be better than absorbing. So same thing. Everybody that in this gas station, every gas station is as you know reflective as mm-hmm. as a as a neon sign. And and I remember when I was that summer when I was doing that for several months, just kind of really not so much being in awe, but really tipping my hat to the fellows who were doing this for a a paycheck, possibly a meager paycheck, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. certainly not living some luxurious lifestyle so whatever they were getting paid um it was barely enough it was probably barely enough and all of these guys had families and kids just like i did and i remember really thinking like wow man this would be i if i if this was my day to day i would be you know I, there there wouldn't be a lot of romance in it like you said That's i would right. be i would be thinking oh man i'd love to uh go in that office yep. and like <laughs> look yeah. at a computer screen. I want to be the guy riding around in that pickup. But you know the, the grass is always greener because yeah. I to be honest, I actually was I was loving that summer and being at that gas station was really energizing and a lot of the guys there I could see had a, a similar energy and it felt it was really fun. So, yeah. you know, you can't say there's there's no value to no. any of that. The the comment I guess that I'm left with is that the grass is always greener it and is. whatever you're doing that's it's got its pluses and minuses. So I had an interesting conversation last night to this point exactly. Well, at least tangentially with Paul Weller, who we're going to have on here. Paul Weller is a house mover. His his niche for a lot of his uh, productive life, and I say productive life, he told me he's just retired. And he also told me it's not all it's cracked up to be. Mm. So I, I used Paul probably four times to jack up or move structures. And then he used me maybe five or six times when he was up here in Douglas County doing something, he knew that I could engage with him and get my hands on equipment and handle concrete. And so we worked together quite a bit and I have nothing but love, trust and respect for Paul Weller. He's just sharp. He's one of those guys that would have been a a well-regarded structural engineer. If he would have gone down that path, Uh, he, I just like, he's just great. But he was saying last night when I was talking to him and I was talking, we, we had a nice conversation about different things. It's been five years since I've spoken with him. He was saying now that in the rearview mirror, he realizes that that work that he was doing, that we were doing, was fun. He realizes now, thinking about it, that the the days that were grinding and the jobs that were spooky and the the checks that were hard to collect and whatever else, that that all added up to fun. Yeah. And now, from a retired position, having sold out of his equipment, he he misses the fun yeah, aspect. I believe that a hundred percent. There's like an exhilaration and a you're pushing yourself and testing yourself and yeah. the conflict and the yes. the successes, all of it amounts to accomplishment. Yep, it does. And without maybe accomplishment in your life to that extent, it would certainly feel like something was missing. That's for sure. I think it's it's kind of the same kind of fun it would be to get on a really intense roller coaster and not buckle the seatbelt. I don't know about that. But I mean, it's fun. Yeah. But baby, you could fly out of this seat and the fun would stop. Mm-hmm. Because it's only fun for he and I talking about it because we kind of survived the experience, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't mean necessarily literally physically survived, but financially got to the other end of it intact. Yeah. But if in the middle of it, you flew out of the seat, yeah. you know, and hit the ground... There probably would be people who would be talking to each other after sharing calamity yeah. who would not think that fun was a way to describe it. Well, maybe this is better identified as risk because yeah. taking risk is fun and is a thrill and a life or a job or a career with no risk. Right. Oh my gosh, kill me. Kill me. That would be... Just shoot me. Yeah. It's like you it's, you know, showing up and let's say a, a factory or a conveyor belt like... <laughs> Put oh that lug gosh. nut on, yeah, for all, all your life. Whereas you you take a, you take some risk and you unhook your safety line, let's say mm-hmm. metaphorically in terms mm-hmm. of paycheck or mm-hmm. lifestyle or whatever. Yep. you know your risk is fun. It's fun R- to take risk. We spend up billions of dollars for the opportunities to experience risk, right? Yeah, and we make heroes out of the people that experience risk in extreme sports and and mm-hmm. and. But. Circling it back around to the rea- the gritty reality of construction, I worked with guys when I was in Las Vegas who were the age that I am right now, 
whose job every day would to be be on their either squatting down or on their knees, dragging a two by four, rotting gravel to grade under an endless procession of house slabs, endless. Mm. And they were 61, 62 in the white fluffy, in the white long sleeve shirts. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they could keep a straw hat on their head that sometimes they couldn't, Mm. but man, the romance was long gone for those guys. God, that's like the worst of all scenarios to play your cards in a way that at the end of the day, you're, you're not that you're still in that spot you know maybe yeah. that's a spot a guy would start his career is yeah. doing that you don't want to end your career there either yeah. well that's great um any last minute comments on the weather it's it oh I'll, I'll i'll share one and i saw this that when i was doing that storage thing and it was the first time i paid attention to it and that is how expensive the weather can be oh. and we, i was doing the, the the meat of that project in the summer and we had two or three big monsoons that flooded the site. It cost me a lot of money, but I, I was paying attention to every other dirt work kind of job site. And there was a big commercial one at the airport, all these open underground utilities that got flooded same weekend as mine. And holy smokes, I was just thinking, oh, wow. So this weather event comes through, it's just weather, nobody's fault, except somebody has got to pay the bill somebody pays. for putting it all back together. Yeah, And that happened to me. I, I don't know what it cost me, maybe like, three or $4,000 total, right. you know, that's a lot of money. And I was not happy, but I was just imagining and visualizing for the first time builders, developers, contractors who get unlucky and have weather cost them tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. And now you got something to complain about. Now you got something and you got attorneys to pay yeah. because now we're trying to assign whose contract covered them against unforeseeable weather events and whose contract didn't. And yeah. somebody's going to pay. Yeah. That's, it's amazing. And, and, Geez, it's like one of those things you just don't think about. You know, it's raining. It's like, oh, that's annoying. I can't go yeah. to the lake, or, or it's oh my my uh, whatever my my coat got wet because I left it on the back porch. Yeah. And it's like that's a bummer. Yeah. But talk about someone whose job site gets ruined, or materials, yeah. or like a pallet of concrete, or whatever it is. So I don't know how interesting concrete stories are in weather, but I I have I have two and one illust. Well, they they both are to the same point. I I was. There was a poor crew, and it, I was there checking grades or something, and the truck backed up to a driveway, and I happened to check my watch when the concrete slid off the end of the chute and dropped onto the subgrade. Boom. And I checked the time. And 20 minutes later, that's two zero. 20 minutes later, those guys were out walking on that concrete, spraying cure on it. Oh, my Done. gosh. In place, rotted, bull-floated, jointed, troweled broomed and sealed in 20 minutes whoa 20 minutes so wow the quality of that concrete had to be terrible it probably if you if there would have been a brake test on it it probably would have broke about 900 pounds yeah. instead of 3500 because the reaction was cut off so quickly was there not some kind of like retarder or something they could have put in there to control that maybe they maybe they essentially did. not then e- either way it got hard it so. got hard not for <laughs> that little job oh. not then not no it just Somebody ordered the mud, and it was probably a hot load. Yeah. The batch plat batched it on top of two or three yards of mud that just came off another job, and some of that may have come off another job, and so that accelerated reaction was seeded into that yeah. batch, and it was going off. You couldn't stop it. Gosh, that's funny. So another job, much bigger, a very elaborate house, lots of radius outside building lines and lots of elevation changes. Tricky setup, high-dollar house in Spanish trails, yeah. actually. And the engineer trying to forestall that had specified that the concrete was never to get above 80 degrees. Mm. And we were, they were taking samples for brake tests and they were, they were testing the temperature of the mud. And if the mud got over 80, you couldn't pour it. And so the mud was being batched with ice. They would just throw 50 pound blocks of ice into the trucks and hammer that in for the water to try Mm -hmm. to drop the temperature. There are better ways to do that now. Mm. So here's what happened. We got it laid down. We got it sealed up. We're waiting to put the machines on it, going to power trial it. Oh, the top is going off. The top is hydrating. It's crusting a little bit. Got to get the machines on there because the top's getting hard. Threw the power trials out there, but the mud was so cold underneath that it wasn't setting up at all. Whoa. So now you're setting power trials on a five or a six-inch slab 
that is soft as the moment it came out of the truck underneath and the top half inch is as hard as this table. And you're trying to trowel that to get it smooth. And what you're doing is just pushing big valleys. And he, it was like a skate park. Whoa. It was, I don't know how that ended up. I was working for MS Concrete at the time. I don't know if there was a tear out. I don't know what, I don't know whose fault that would have been, but it was an unworkable engineering solution. Yeah. He put you in a corner. It was just a corner you couldn't get out of. Now yeah. today you could, you could mist the, the mm-hmm. site you can spray on I, what's it called con film you can spray on the top to keep the top from crusting so it'll mm. kind of lay there while it all catches up but at the time a little breeze came up 115 degree morning and it was a wreck i'm not wow. even interested in knowing how it turned out so weather is expensive yeah all right well put your comments in the stories i have i have a feeling you guys have some uh, pretty relevant anecdotes to yeah. this thanks for tuning in thanks for supporting our channel thanks for leaving comments on this and our main channel and we will catch you next time